Greetings, this is Greg. I want to talk about the Aleutian IL-2 Sturmovik. This was the Soviet Union's premier ground attack airplane for most of the Second World War, and its basic design carried on into the Cold War with its successor, the IL-10. There is so much I could potentially talk about with this airplane that it's hard to know where to start, what to include, and what to leave out. When I'm in the process, the early production process of making videos for this channel, I often start off by reading the pilot's manual for the airplane in question. And I did that for this video as well. I read the Soviet IL-2 pilot manual, which of course meant I had to translate it first. I got about halfway through translating the manual before I realized that in this particular case, reading the pilot's manual wasn't doing me any good. I still translated the whole thing and read it, but learned very little about the airplane from doing it. This brings me to my first point I want to discuss, which isn't specifically about the IL-2, but I suppose is more about World War II aviation in general. The pilot's manual from the various countries in World War II tell us more than just information about the airplanes. They sort of give us a window into the training and the attitudes towards pilots at the time. For example, the U.S. Army Air Force pilot manuals are relatively long and full of technical information, including detailed systems diagrams and pictures. Most of the information contained in them is specific to the aircraft in question, and rarely will you see these manuals contain very basic or general airmanship information. Sometimes you do, but it's rare. The U.S. fighter aircraft manuals are very clearly written for a well-trained pilot transitioning from an advanced trainer like an AT-6 Texan. In other words, they're written for a competent pilot who already knows how to fly a supercharged, powerful, complex airplane, and with about 300 hours of flight time before stepping into something like a P-51 Mustang. The British manuals are quite different. They have what an experienced pilot needs to know and nothing more. They are very dry and with very few pictures or diagrams. For example, the manuals for the early Spitfires and Hurricanes seem to be aimed at a fully qualified combat pilot who is transitioning in from something like a Gloucester Gladiator and only has maybe an hour or so to flip through the manual before taking off to intercept some in inbound German aircraft. Now, the German manuals are a bit more like the U.S. manuals, although it depends a bit on which German manual you're looking at. The Focke Wolf FW-190A manuals have a ton of information. The BF-109, less so, but still a lot. Interestingly, the German manuals are also the most fun. This one is a document on fighter pilot gunnery, but their tank manuals are the same way, so this wasn't a Luftwaffe thing. Obviously, I have to keep this family friendly, so I can't show you too much here, but I think you get the point. The Soviet aircraft manuals, at least the two that I have bothered to translate, which are the IL-2 and the LA-5FN manuals, read as if they are written for absolute beginners. They're almost childish in their nature. They lack detailed technical or system information. The IL-2's manual is literally a step-by-step -step guide telling you exactly what to do from the time you walk up to the airplane to the time when you walk away after your flight. Not all of the Soviet manuals are like this, but the IL-2 and the LA-5FN definitely are. Let's take a look at the manual for the P-51B Mustang for comparison. It's full of technical details and system diagrams. However, when you turn to the section on operating the airplane, it's very basic. It doesn't tell you that when you walk up to the airplane, you should make sure that the tires have air in them or to make sure that the pitot covers are removed and all the panels are attached to the plane. The P-51B manual assumes the pilot already knows how to do a basic pre-flight. Those basics are covered in other manuals related to primary flight training. But by the time a pilot's getting into a P-51, he's expected to know this stuff. The IL-2 manual is entirely different. Let's take a look at a few pages so you can see what I mean. This one says, in part, show up to the airplane, talk to the mechanic to determine its status. This isn't a word-for-word -word translation. I'm just giving you the gist of it. Next page, we have three panels here. At the top, it talks about the propeller. Check the hub and the blades for holes, scratches, or bending. The middle section tells you to make sure that the bottom engine access covers are locked in place. It specifically points out the forward pin here, which seems to have a safety pin in it, much like a cotter pin. 
The bottom panel tells you to make sure your tires are not flat and your landing gear shock isn't collapsed. It gives you the measurements in millimeters, so you know just how low they can be. There's no need for a pressure gauge here. Once in the cockpit, it spells out everything there, too, in a step-by-step -step format with pictures from uh, the time you climb in till the time you get out and a little bit beyond. It even goes so far as to remind you which way the control surfaces deflect with input from the stick and pedals. This step-by-step -step format continues through the entire flight. It even covers basic navigation techniques like dead reckoning and pilotage, stuff that would normally be well understood before getting past primary flight training and into a combat airplane. At the end of the flight, it has you open the armored hatches and check for leaks, and then report to the engineer, who I think was sort of an engineering and weapons officer, and finally let the mechanic know what needs to be fixed. Of course, it also covers the controls, and the manual has this excellent cockpit diagram, which I used quite a bit as I learned about the airplane systems. I should also note that the Soviets did have very detailed maintenance manuals for the IL-2. Most of the detailed drawings in this video come from those. I'm mentioning this because I find it interesting that the IL-2 pilot manual reads like it's written for a student pilot with no more than about 20 hours of flight time. No other nation had manuals like this, at least not that I've seen, and I've looked at a lot of pilot manuals from all the major players in World War II. The IL-2 manual's format directly relates to the state of Soviet pilot training during the war, which is a topic I don't want to spend time on, at least right now. Let's move on to the plane itself. The IL-2 is unique in many ways. To start with, I don't know of any other airplane that had a world leader, in this case Joseph Stalin, take so much interest in its development or production, and Stalin really did pay a lot of attention to this airplane. Around February of 1938, Sergei Aleutian sent his proposal for a heavily armored ground attack plane to Stalin himself and to other key Soviet leaders. Aleutian stressed the need for what he called a, quote, flying tank, unquote. Sergei Aleutian wasn't a nobody at the time. He had serious aviation credentials and was well known. He had even been awarded the Order of Lenin. His proposal was accepted by Stalin, and Aleutian started to move forward with the design, which was to become the IL-2. And I should say that during the design and testing phase, the plane had different designations and only acquired the official IL-2 designation in April of 1941. But for simplicity, I'm referring to all the versions from the development stages as IL-2s. There were many planes in World War II with significant armor protection, but Sergei Aleutian took this to a whole other level for this project. In 1938, when he started work on this, armor on combat aircraft was uncommon, meaning that most combat aircraft had no armor plate of any kind. During World War II, the importance of armor was realized pretty quickly. And by mid-1942, most combat airplanes had at least some armor protection. But in 1938, this just wasn't the case, so Aleutian was ahead of the curve here. The second fact that makes the IL-2's armor special is the amount of it. Aleutian didn't simply put some armor plates in to protect the pilot or other critical things from fire coming in from very specific angles. Instead, he protected not only the pilot, but the engine fuel tanks, critical engine controls, the cooling system, and he protected these things with a meaningful amount of armor, generally from 5 millimeters in thickness up to about 12 millimeters. This was enough to stop 8 millimeter rounds, which is about 30 caliber in U.S. terms. It would also provide protection at shallow angles and longer ranges against more powerful weapons like 13 millimeter or 50 caliber, even 20 millimeter rounds uh, in some cases. The third factor making the IL-2's armor special is that it wasn't just armor plate added to an airplane. Rather, the armor itself was a part of the aircraft's structure. The engine and cockpit were essentially enclosed in an armored tub, which acted as a load-bearing structure to which other things attached. This saved weight and allowed for a lot of armor to be used but with a reduced weight penalty. That's not to say the IL-2 isn't heavy. It is. Typical versions 
had an empty weight of about 10,000 pounds or just about 4,400 kilos. That's a lot for a single engine World War II airplane, but in comparative terms, it's not as much as you might think. Just off the top of my head, I can think of two single engine US airplanes that had higher empty weights. First, we have the Grumman Avenger. Sure, it's bigger, but it has an air-cooled engine, which saves some weight, and nowhere near as much armor. Yet empty, the Avenger is about 700 pounds heavier than the IL-2. Republic's P-47 Thunderbolt is also slightly heavier than the IL-2, although there is some overlap there depending on just which models we're looking at. Grumman's F-6F Hellcat is only about 400 pounds lighter than the IL-2. Of course, all these numbers are general representations. There were many versions of each airplane, but the takeaway here is that in spite of all of that armor, the IL-2 wasn't all that heavy, and that's really the brilliance of Aleutian's design. Now, this idea of using an armored tub as a load-bearing structure wasn't new. The Germans did it in World War I. However, among World War II airplanes, the IL-2's armor configuration was unique. The rest of the airplane was designed with survivability in mind. The rear fuselage, wings, and tail had a lot of substance to their structure. These sections were generally not armored, but they certainly were not weak by aircraft standards of the time. The wing had a lot of area. Compared with the P-47 Thunderbolt, the IL-2 has 38% more wing area, and it's generally a lighter airplane. This helps with low-speed flying, but it also means that holes in the wing don't hurt performance as much as it would with a high wing loading, so it enhances survivability, at least in regards to hits from small arms fire. It also enhances turn performance. The landing gear was designed so that if it didn't come down, minimal damage would result from a gear-up landing. One of the bigger challenges with the IL-2 is coming up with a way to protect the cooling system from damage. The IL-2 uses a liquid-cooled V-12. I think we all know that with engines of this type, the cooling system's radiator and associated lines are its Achilles heel. One bullet in the radiator and the engine will quickly overheat and falter. Of course, one way around this is to put in an air-cooled engine. That's just what Sukhoi did with their Su-6 or Su-6 which was a competitor to Aleutian's proposed IL-2 design. The Su-6 was to be powered by the Schwetzoff M71, a monster of an air-cooled radial. This engine displaced 59.7 liters, or 3,643 cubic inches, making it larger than even the US R-3350 powering the B-29s. The Soviet M71 had tremendous power, with 2,200 horsepower, and more powerful versions were in development. Unfortunately for Sukhoi and the Su-6, they simply bet on the wrong engine. The M-71 never made it into production, thus neither did the Su-6. Of course, the obvious question is, why didn't the IL-2 use an air-cooled radial? This really comes down to timing and logistics. When development started on this airplane in 1938, the Soviets had air-cooled radial engines. They just didn't have the ideal one for the IL-2 project. For example, they had the ASH or ASH-62. This is basically a license-built Wright R-1820. It's seen here on a Soviet license-built DC-3. It's a good engine, and it served the Soviets well in many different applications. But it just doesn't have enough power for use in the IL-2. The engine that Sergei Aleutian bet on initially was the McCoolin AM-35, a liquid-cooled V-12. AM stands for Alexander McCoolin. The AM-35 was in development in 1938. It had not actually run yet. However, it was still a safe bet because it was based on the AM-34, which had been running since 1931 in all sorts of things, aircraft, boats, and tanks. During development of the plane, the yet more powerful AM-38 came out, which was a further development of the AM-35. Thus, production IL-2s started with the AM-38 liquid-cooled V-12. But the idea of powering a ground-attack airplane with an air-cooled radial was still valid, or so it seemed. And it was thought that the right radial would eventually come along. Now, we talked about the M-71 radial a few moments ago, and Aleutian did look at that. It's not clear to me if one was ever fitted to an IL-2, 
In any case, I haven't found a picture of a Sturmovic so equipped. Either way, as I mentioned earlier, the M71 never made it into production, so the idea of an M71-powered IL-2 is completely DOA. However, when the new M82 air-cooled radial came along, that absolutely was fitted to the Sturmovic, as seen in this picture. The M82, which is often called the ASH or ASH-82, was one of the best Soviet engines of the war. It's roughly equivalent to a U.S. Wright R2600, as used in Grumman Avengers, or Germany's BMW 801 radial, as used in FW190 Antons. The M82 powered the LA-5 fighter and various other types, and served well in these roles. I have a video that talks about it quite a bit. Uh, here's, here's a picture of it. I'll put a link in the description. The M82-powered IL-2 made its first flight in September of 1941. And this wasn't some half-baked marriage of airframe and engine. This was a very well-thought-out and developed variant. An armored rear gunner position was added. Up until this point, most production IL-2s were single-seaters. Fuel capacity was increased, and the engine installation incorporated a revised armor layout, because they obviously had to armor different things. There were two different armored layouts proposed, but both of them provided decent protection for the already less vulnerable air-cooled engine. The plane's performance was just slightly inferior to that of the liquid-cooled model, mainly because it was less streamlined, but the decrease wasn't enough to matter, and by the end of 1942, the air-cooled IL-2 had passed all of the state's acceptance trials and was recommended for production. Production of this airplane was planned to commence in the second quarter of 1942, but it never happened. Well, oddly, one production example was built, and even more oddly, it reverted to the single-seater configuration, which is a whole other story. Sergei Aleutian urged the Soviet Minister of Aviation, his name was Alexei Shakurin, to put the radial engine variant into production, but for reasons that are not recorded, it never happened. It seems that there were at least two factors at work here. First, the M82 engine was needed in other applications. Second, and probably more importantly, anything that disrupted IL-2 production was likely to get the people involved some really unwanted attention from Joseph Stalin. Switching the plane over to such a radically different variant was likely to interrupt production at least to some extent, and the supply chain issues could have adversely affected production of other airplanes as well. In short, it just wasn't worth the risk. Of course, in Soviet World War II aviation, not making improvements was risky as well. In 1946, Stalin threw Shikorin in prison on charges that during Shikorin's term as Minister of Aviation, the Soviet felt Union fell behind and was producing inferior aircraft. That charge was true, but there were reasons for it that were mostly beyond Shikorin's control. For one thing, in 1941, Shikorin had to move the entire Soviet aircraft industry. That included over 1,500 factories and their workers. And he had to move them all east of the Ural Mountains to put them out of range of the German bombers. Now, that was a massive undertaking and was a much higher priority than making incremental improvements to aircraft designs. Another factor was the way Soviets developed and built aircraft under Stalin. Aleutian was a design bureau headed by Sergei Aleutian, not an aircraft manufacturer. The same was true of the other design bureaus, MIG and so forth. The actual manufacturing of the aircraft was done by state-owned and controlled factories. This is just how communism works. Sergei Aleutian can't own a factory under that system. That would go completely against the principles of communism. The result here was that quite a bit of additional bureaucracy was in place between the design teams and the actual production of the aircraft, which slowed the rate of improvements and slowed innovation. Alexei Shikorin was a part of that system. He was literally the guy in charge of it. But by its very nature, it caused the Soviet aviation to fall behind. Now, I know that some Soviet fanboys are upset and will insist that the Soviets were not behind. Well, Joseph Stalin himself says that they were. Plus, they resorted to building a rivet-by-rivet -rivet copy of the B-29 to try and catch up, which I think says a lot about the state of Soviet aviation in 1945-46. Anyway, 
The air-cooled engine IL-2 simply didn't happen, and production versions use the AM38 liquid-cooled V12. Now, this is a decent engine. It's certainly not amazing, but it's okay for the application, and that's the key. We have to keep in mind the conditions of the engine's usage in the IL-2. There was a war on. The good news is that on paper, the AM38 is reasonably powerful. Sources on this vary a bit, and finding primary and official data for this airplane is more of a problem than I thought it would be. I'm using numbers from this book as it seems to be well-researched and accurate. The authors list the power for the early IL-2s at 1,660 horsepower and the number for later models at 1,750. I'm well aware that numbers from other sources vary a bit, but not by all that much. The plane's supercharging system was optimized for low-altitude work, which makes sense considering the plane's intended usage. The engine made its maximum power at 1,360 millimeters of mercury, or about 54 inches of manifold pressure, at only 2,350 RPM. The AM38 does have some serious drawbacks. Compared to the V12 from Germany, Britain, and the U.S., the Soviet engine was huge, with 46.66 liters of displacement. Let me put some numbers on the screen here for comparison. This thing was almost 20 liters larger than a Merlin, and was even larger than a Pratt & Whitney R2800. In some other respects, the design of the AM38 is quite similar to the other liquid-cooled V12s. It has four valves per cylinder, a centrifugal supercharger, and so on, but it's unusually large. Now, being larger by itself isn't really a bad thing, but in the case of the AM38, it has the fuel consumption of a huge 46-plus liter engine, but not the horsepower, at least not by mid- or late-war standards. Early in the war, say during 1941, 1,660 horsepower was pretty respectable, and more than the typical Daimler-Benz or Rolls-Royce V12s of the time. However, as the war went on, those engines gained a lot of power, and the AM38 didn't gain that much. By 1944, the smaller engines were making as much or more power in a smaller, lighter, more fuel-efficient package. The AM38's horsepower is restricted primarily by engine speed. It redlines at 2,350 RPM, which is just way too low to make a lot of horsepower. Actually, the fact that it makes as much as it does at such a low RPM is pretty impressive, and it's doing that mainly because of its displacement. The engine's other parameters are fairly normal, compression, manifold pressure, and so on. So why not just revise the engine so that it can rev higher? Well, that's easier said than done. The problem wasn't a single-engine component that needed improvement, but rather that the AM38 was really an AM35, which was itself an upgraded AM34. They had already increased power several times, and RPM at least once up from the AM35's red line of 2050 RPM. I'm not sure it was in the original AM34, but it was probably lower than that. Information on the AM38 engine is relatively scarce, but from just looking at it and its successor, the AM42, I think we can see why its red line is so low. First of all, the AM38's crankshaft doesn't have any counterweights, which makes eliminating vibration at higher RPM a problem. It doesn't mean it couldn't be done. There are engines without counterweights on the crankshaft that rev sky high, but it's difficult. The space around the crankshaft, or in other words, the crankcase, is so small that I don't think simply putting in a crank with counterweights was an option. There's also some complication with the connecting rods, which I don't fully understand. There are some translation issues with Soviet text here and no good pictures of the uh, AM38's connecting rods. But apparently some of the cylinders in this engine have a different stroke than others. And this has something to do with what they call articulated connecting rods. But I think this term is the result of an unclear or incomplete translation. And I can't find any good drawing or explanation of this for the AM38. I find something similar for some of the other Soviet V12s. But in any case, different strokes means different piston speeds, which is going to create a balancing nightmare at higher RPM. In any case, we have a pretty good idea what they would have needed to change to get more RPM out of the engine because McCoolin built the AM42, which is more or less 
an upgraded AM38. Now the AM42 has a red line of 2500 RPM, still not on par with most of the other V12s of the era, but we can look at the changes they made to get the extra engine speed. These included a new crankshaft with counterweights, a revised crankcase to put the crankshaft in, new pistons, connecting rods, and other reinforced components. They also lowered the compression ratio and raised the manifold pressure, and got 2,000 horsepower from the AM42. It was too late to use this newer engine in the IL-2, but it was used in the IL-10. Of course, by this point, 2,000 horsepower from a V12 this size just wasn't that impressive. The basic design of the engine just didn't allow for a lot of RPM, and thus not a lot of power. And I think a lot of this has to do with the way some of the connecting rods attach, but I'm just not sure. The Soviets did have various other V12s, which were more comparable in size and power to the typical European V12s, but these really were not usable in the IL-2 for a number of reasons, mainly logistical. For example, by the time they had a version of the Klimov V12 with enough power to match the Mikulin, the IL-2s were already in production, and the Mikulins were doing just fine, and the Klimovs were being used in other aircraft. We have to discuss the McCoolin's cooling system in the IL-2. There's no way to armor a radiator itself. A radiator needs to be made from thin material in order to allow the transfer of heat easily from the coolant inside the radiator to the airflow going through the core. So Aleutian's original idea was to have a retractable radiator. It would protrude out of the aircraft's belly during normal operations and then retract into the armored tub during the attack runs. This was a novel but horrible idea. It seriously limited the time the plane could stay in combat because the engine would overheat very quickly when the radiator was in the retracted position. It also introduces a lot of complexity into the aircraft and raised the pilot's workload. Aleutian went with a much better solution, which was to bury the radiator in the armored tub and duct air to it from the top of the cowling and then out through the bottom. This was simple and effective. The oil cooler was located in an armored structure on the belly of the aircraft. This was decent, but not as well protected as the radiator. In fact, a common tactic for German fighter pilots was to pull up close behind the airplane just below it and aim for this, because although it was well armored, Bullets or shells coming from the rear could defeat the armor without too much trouble because they could enter the oil cooler exhaust duct and then bounce around in there and damage the oil cooler itself. It's not a super easy shot to make, but at close range with two machine guns plus some cannons, the total amount of lead headed that direction gives that tactic a reasonable chance of success. There is just so much more to talk about with this airplane that I think I'll have to do it over several parts. The airframe, armament, and most of all, the operational usage of this plane are all huge topics by themselves. At some point, I want to talk about the IL-2 versus fighter planes. By the numbers, it should be able to take on enemy fighters with some chance of success. For example, as compared with the P-39 Era Cobra, a fighter the Soviets did quite well with, the IL-2 Sturmovik has a much lower wing loading and a power to weight ratio that's right there with the P-39. So you would think that the Sturmovik could fight on somewhat even terms with enemy fighters. Yet the reality of the war showed us something very different. And I think the reasons for that will make an interesting discussion. Before I go down that path, I'm interested to see how this video does in terms of views. As a general rule, videos about Soviet stuff don't get a lot of views on this channel. They do get a fair amount of hate, which doesn't bother me, but it's interesting to note. Plus, the Soviet aircraft are the most difficult ones to research, even more difficult than Japanese or Italian planes. It's not due to a lack of material. It's a lack of consistent material from unbiased sources. A lot that has been written on this airplane comes from areas where the authors cannot say whatever they want without fear of reprisals from the state. Writing about Soviet stuff is a pain. That said, I do want to talk more about it, so I'll see how this video does. That's it for now. I want to thank all my subscribers and especially my Patreon supporters. Patreon supporters often get early access to my videos as well as access to all the manuals I use in production of these videos, including every manual used in this one. I'll put up a poll on Patreon to see if folks want more IL-2 or
one of the other things I'm working on instead. Goodbye for now and have a great day.